For each of you at home and all of you in this room this morning, we want to invite you to worship with us. This world's a little bit crazy. Uh, we feel like we're probably standing on some shifting kinds of sand. But with the psalmist, we cry out, the Lord is my rock. Always has been, is, and always will be. So let's stand together as we sing about God being our rock. I can see the clouds rolling I can feel the winds they try to shake me I will not be moved My feet are on the rock I can feel the waters rise I can hear the howling lights that haunt me Fear will hold me Jesus. 
Jesus, there's nothing impossible for you. can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the... Come on, church! Almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. stand as we continue to worship this morning.
Guys, as you're uh, being seated, let's take our Bibles, your smart device, and uh, let's turn to Psalm 42 and 43. Unless you have had your head in the sand for these past 18 months of this pandemic, uh, you would have realized that uh, over the course of those many months, uh, mental health issues like depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress have manifested themselves in untold millions experiencing these things for, for the very first time, uh, regardless of age, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of socioeconomic standing, uh, literally tens of millions of people globally are suffering exponentially. The numbers are staggering and they are unprecedented. More and more are having disproportionate unhealthy outcomes mental health outcomes, uh, elevated substance abuse, suicidal ideation. Uh, the impact is telling and it's taking a toll. What I want to do this morning and maybe for the weeks to come is I want to come alongside this topic and I want to establish a kind of spiritual foundation for each and every one of us that maybe struggle with this or have at different times struggled with these kinds of, of issues. And as I get into this message this morning, as we begin looking at the experience of the psalmist, you may say, well, man, this is just out of my, you know, this doesn't even relate to me. And, and, and if that is true of you, if you've never experienced uh, mental health issues, you've never had issues of anxiety, depression, post-traumatic stress, whatever, whatever it may be, and this is so far removed from anything in your life experience or the life of your family, man, that is, that is wonderful for you. And I'm glad for you. The reality is that most of us deal with these issues at one time or another in our life. That's one of the reasons I'm so appreciative of, of the psalmist in our passage this morning, but the psalms in, in general. Because when it comes to mental health issues, I fear that this is one of those topics where we as the church are probably most dishonest, where we lack transparency where we are so caught up in maintaining a facade of having our act together that we fail to talk about issues such as this. That's one of the reasons I appreciate the Psalter altogether. Two thirds of these Psalms in scripture are nothing but, but laments. And there's a section of them, uh, chapter 42 and 43 included, are called Psalms of disorientation people because of the circumstances of life, because they are overwhelmed by life, they are going through a season where they feel disoriented, where they feel overwhelming sadness, where they are anguishing, where they, like our psalmist, have a foreboding sense of despair. That refrain is found over and over again in Psalm 42 and 43 and verse 5 of chapter 42. Why are you in despair, my soul? Why are you restless within me? Those very words are found again recurring in, in verse 11 of Psalm 42 and again in verse 5 of, of verse 43. These are feelings and emotions that, that are very real. And some therapist reading this passage today uh, would say that, that he is suffering from, from a form of depression. He's disoriented in life. And so what he needs is a, is a reorientation 
of how things are supposed to look and how things are supposed to be interpreted in the mind from a, from a faith perspective and a faith foundation. And so what, what I want to acknowledge this morning is sometimes these, these issues that manifest themselves like depression, anxiety, uh, post-traumatic stress, sometimes these things, they, uh, they, have, they, they occur because of very real neurological disorders requiring both, both medication and, and therapy hand in hand. And listen, you, you are never going to hear me say and hold forth the position that somehow mental health issues are a faith issue. Or that if you were just stronger in your faith, if you, if you be- believed appropriately, that you wouldn't be dealing with these kinds of issues. You will never hear me say that, and you will never hear me take an issue that is, that is as complex as mental health wellness and try to tell you that if you'll just take notes here this morning, I'm going to give you three points in a poem and your depression will disappear, which is done from a great many pulpits, sadly. But what I want to do is I want to come come alongside as a pastor, as as an under-shepherd, understanding the importance of spiritual health and spiritual well-being I want to come alongside those even that, that, that have disorders or disease that, that require medication, that, that require continual therapy. I, I want to come al- alongside every one of us and to establish some, some practical spiritual issues because our, our wellness and our wholeness is never complete just through physical well-being or mental well-being. You should not be surprised that as a pastor, uh, I believe that, that life is sacred. I believe that we are very much spiritual beings. And so that if I'm truly going to, to be healthy in life, that it requires uh, spiritual well-being, mental well-being, and physical well-being. That there is a dynamic that, that works. And so what I'm going to do this morning is I want to come alongside all of us that have struggled at times with these kind of, of issues and to establish what I hope will be for each one of us some, some very real, practical, foundational truths that will serve in our times of anguish and in our times of, of heartache and depression and anxiety when our, when our mind is saying one thing to us, when our mind is trying to convince us of something else. What I want to do this morning is to offer some practical helps for you in these times that will be a touchstone for you, that will establish unwavering truths for you, that hopefully will be helpful for you in these seasons, when your mind is trying to tell you something different. The psalmist is very transparent, and I appreciate that because we have so stigmatized mental health issues in this country and our culture. I want to say to you, first of all, before I get into these practical points. If these are issues that you've struggled with, listen, don't don't ever let anyone make you think this is a faith issue. Do you know who in Scripture who struggled with with mental health issues, depression especially? Abraham, Moses, Elijah, the psalmist, the apostle Paul. You go through and actually read the narratives of their life, and you'll see that these, there are very real seasons in those individuals' lives where they struggle with these kind of issues. And so you're in good, good company, and I appreciate the transparency of, of the psalmist. He doesn't try to hide it. He doesn't try to just stick his head in the sand and pretend it's not there. This is a very real issue that he is processing in his life, in his faith journey. And so I want us to borrow from him and learn from his experience. And so my starting place this morning in trying to give you some some foundational ground, trying to give you a touchstone that you can always come to in these seasons of life, it begins with this in these first five chapters. The first thing that is necessary is you have to decide who you are. You have to establish your identity of who you are. You have to define who you are 
in what you are. Because like the psalmist, when we come to these seasons in life, that becomes a very real issue because your mind and your thoughts are saying one thing to you, but what you need is in your mind, determine once and for all, define who you are. You see the issue here. He says, as the deer pants, as the deer pants for the water brooks, so my soul pants for you, God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have, have been my food day and night while they say to me all day long, where is your God? I remember these things and pour out my soul within me for I used to go over with the multitude and, and walk them to the house of God with a voice of joy and thanksgiving, a multitude celebrating a festival. Why are you in despair, my soul? Why are, you, why are you restless within me? Wait for God, for I will again praise him for the help of his presence, my God. You know what I, you know what I see in these verses when I, when I read them, when I reflect upon them, when I try to, to put myself in, into his position? And understanding from where he's coming, as I, as I listen to his words, as I, as I sit as his feet, at his feet and imagine myself in his situation, I see in, in his words, or I see here in this passage, a man who is allowing his identity to be determined by his circumstances. A man who is allowing his, his well-being, his sense of wholeness, uh, being determined by his circumstances. Instead of his established identity, instead of his identity as a man of God, as a person of God, a man of faith, determining his reaction to the circumstances of life and, and interpreting life as such through the prism of faith, I see a man here whose identity is being, and his sense of well-being is being determined by, by circumstances. The prevalence of emotions right now determining his sense of, of well-being. And we're not really surprised by this, are we? Because we're, we're all guilty of, of the same thing. When, when circumstances in life are favorable, we feel good about ourselves, don't we? And then when the unfortunate happens, our, our life seems to go sour, we go through seasons in life where, where, where nothing seems right and nothing is, is fulfilling, nothing brings joy. You, you notice the theme here, always looking for things, circumstances to bring to me a sense of, of well-being. But those whose identity is established and determined by, by circumstances, it it, it triggers emotions for many that, that have never been experienced. Or what about, and I think this is prevalent in our day and time, uh, what about those who, whose sense of well-being, uh, their sense of personhood is determined by looking at the life experiences of others? And this is where social media becomes detrimental. Where you scroll through and you're looking at the lives of others, the places they go, the, the things that, that they do. And their sense of, of identity is, is lost. Instead of making it into something that, that is all negative, I read a peer-reviewed journal this past week that actually talked about what is negative in social media and just passive scrolling is the most negative, it has the most negative mental impact upon you and you just passively scroll through social media. But what can be especially actually ben of benefit uh, during, a, during times of social isolation such as we're facing right now in some quarters, uh, what can actually be helpful is when you're proactively engaged in, in social media or, or even gaming, for instance. Multi-level gaming is actually found to be beneficial socially during these times of, of isolation. But what becomes problematic is when we are allowing our identity, who we are, our sense of, of wholeness and well-being 
being determined by something outside of us. It is of absolute importance for our mental well-being to know who we are spiritually. The importance of knowing who you are, it's the language we hear a great deal today. You, do you hear individuals talk often about, I'm, I'm just, well, I'm just looking, I'm searching for myself. You know, I'm trying to find out who I am. You know, sometimes you just got to nip that in the bud. You know, when my son was, Hunter was going off to college, you know, I was, uh, I, I said to him, one of the last things I said to him, you know, this, this is not a grand experiment for Hunter to find out who he is. You know, and oftentimes I see parents that, that do that and, you know, it's tempting to do that. You know, they go off to school and they make a semester of bad grades. And what do we do as parents? We excuse it. We say, well, you know, they're, you know, this first semester, they're just finding themselves. And I told Hunter before he left, I said, this is not 16 weeks we're going to spend for you to sign your, find yourself. You better go locked and loaded on who you are. I said, because you'll have your behind back here in, the Jan in January and, and you'll be living at home with us and going to school. This is not a grand experiment to find out who Hunter is. He said, well, you know, I've already signed a one-year lease for my uh, dorm. And I said, I could care, I could care less about that. I, I said, I'll have you back home in January and I'll still pay that dorm and still come out cheaper than you living out there. <laughs> but you hear this much, I'm, I'm finding, I'm trying to find out who I am. For listen, listen, if you call yourself a follower of Christ, and this is what has to be, this is what has to be so foundational is that regardless of circumstances, regardless of what is happening in the world around you, as desperately as you want some group to receive you and to accept you and to fit in, to know who you are in Christ Jesus is to remove, you, is to remove yourself from that contest. I mean, that, that, that's just a game that you never win out there. And the beauty of the life of faith is that when I'm in Christ, Jesus has established once and for all who I am. Listen, our touchstone in this and knowing who, who we are, this is something that, that the Apostle Paul would affirm. For instance, in, in the book of Colossians chapter 2 and verse 10, I love this verse because Paul says, In Christ you have been brought to fullness. In Christ, you have been brought to fullness. It means completeness, wholeness, integrity, the integrity of your being, your fullness, your wholeness, your completeness is fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. What, this, what you want so desperately from this world externally apart from you, the world is incapable of giving it to you. And so Paul is, is adamant in his, in, his, in his writing that in Christ you have been brought to fullness. In the Ephesian letter, chapter 1 and verse 5, to a church that was going through great persecution, he said to those people who were wondering, who were in these unfavorable circumstances, he said, hey, listen, God, God has predestined us. Not a statement to create confusion, but to give encouragement to you. He has predestined us. That means he has, he has predestined you. Your identity is in the Father. Your identity is in Christ. You abide in him and him in you. But the words of the prophet Jeremiah perhaps offer the greatest reassurance. When he says, before, before I formed you, in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. Listen, I don't, know, I don't know what you're struggling with today, but you need to hear these words as if the prophet is sitting right in front of you speaking these words to you. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Don't think that you being here is some accident or don't think that you being here, uh, that you're just the result and the product of, of a woman and a man coming together in, in sexual union. No, I, I'm the agency of your presence. I'm the agent of, of your existence. I knew you before I formed you in your, in your mother's womb. You are, Peter would write, 1 Peter 2, 9, 
You are a chosen people. You means you are a chosen person. When you get locked in and you truly embrace that, that your identity is in Christ, Regardless of your emotional state, listen, church, regardless of your emotional state and your emotional battles, no matter what, a mind, what your mind in certain seasons of life is trying to tell you and what you're struggling with, the battle is real, the struggle is real, but this has to be a touchstone in your worst, darkest moments. You have to have this as your touchstone. This is who I am in Christ Jesus. Nothing changes that. And so if my identity is fixed, if I've defined who I am in Christ Jesus, the second thing that is of absolute import is that you determine to think as such. That you determine to think as such. Picking it up in verse six, my soul is in despair within me. Therefore, I, I remember you from the land of, of the Jordan and the peaks of Hermon from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep at the sound of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have passed over me. The Lord will send, will send his goodness in the daytime and his song will be with me in the night. A prayer in the God of my life. I will say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me. Why do I go about mourning because of the oppression of the enemy and as a shattering of my bones, my adversaries taunt me while they say to me all day long, where is your God? Why are you in despair, O oh my soul? Why are you restless within me? Wait for God, for I will again praise him for the help of his presence my God. I want you to see in his example and his questioning and his introspection. I want you to see from this the importance of spiritual well-being. I want you to see the importance of good thinking when it comes to dealing with mental wellness. Good thinking is vital. Because you see, the man has been honest. He has, he has shown us that he's not thinking well. He doesn't have the mindset that he needs to have to embrace this battle. We see his, his struggle between despair and hope. How he goes back and forth, even in, in just one verse on some occasions. But you can see in that word despair that, that his mind is not right. He's not thinking the way that he ought to think which is the real issue when it comes to mental wellness. The fact that he speaks so openly of his despair. Listen, there is nothing more arrogant and presumptuous than the emotion of despair. Because despair assumes that God is doing nothing. To come to a place of, of despair is to presume that God is not active, that God is not living, that God is not alive, that God is somehow not engaged in his, in his created or, order. Spending way too much time inside his own head. He's preoccupied with his misery. It's found throughout those verses I read. He is preoccupied with his misery. He's spending way too much time in introspection. And listen, introspection is very different from, from self-examination. You and I are called to self-examination. I have to examine my life. That's in keeping with the language of Paul when he talks about in his epistles, taking off and putting on. It's only by self-reflection that, that I'm aware of things in my life that don't belong there, that impede my relationship with Christ. So I want to put those things off and I want to put on Christ's likeness. That's vastly different from what the psalmist is dealing with. He is so focused on his misery. He is so preoccupied with his misery, he can't get outside of his own head. And he needs a reorientation of his disorientation. Listen, the mind is a very powerful thing, a very influential thing. Right thinking 
has a very vital role in the faith experience and the journey of faith. I mean, even, even, the, even the wisdom writer would say, guard your heart for it is the wellspring of life. For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. The things that we dwell upon are going to be manifested in the life that we live. And so don't ever think that, that the life of faith is something that is separate and apart from good, critical, thoughtful thinking. It's, it's always been a travesty for me to think that in the, the American church, the overwhelming majority think that you have to uh, open up the top of your head and unscrew your brain and, and leave it out in the foyer before you can come in the sanctuary. Nothing could be further from the truth. We are called to be a thinking people because it's what we think about that becomes the reality of who we are. And that's not a bunch of psychological mumbo jumbo. Listen, theology preceded psychology as a discipline. In fact, psychology, we could say, has, has borrowed from theology some of these very basic foundational ideas of how a man thinks, how a person thinks. Paul would say in Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2, set your mind, set your mind on things above. Instead of, instead of dwelling and, and living in the paralysis of analysis, instead of, instead, of just, instead of just camping out inside your own head, he says, put your mind on things above, not, not on, on earthly things. Writing to the church at Philippi, this is a man who was in prison, writing this letter of joy to the church at, at Philippi in chapter 4 and verse 8. He lists this catalog of virtues. And then Paul says, a man writing this from prison says, let your mind dwell on these things. A man who's facing an, un, an uncertain sentence. A man who, if he had a reason at all to, to whine and complain about the circumstances of life, to, to allow that to overwhelm him. He said, no, here's, here's some virtues that are still in the world, and I want you to dwell upon these. It's, it, it's actually a word from which we get our word logarithm, a deliberate and prolonged contemplation. I want you to let your mind dwell upon these things. Because these things will become the reality of who you are. To the church at Rome in chapter 12 and verse 2, he'd say, don't be conformed to this world. This world and its circumstances is constantly trying to mold and shape you into something that, that, is, that is not representative of the people of God. And so here's your solution. Don't be conformed to this world. Be transformed by what? The renewing of your mind. Thinking differently how I process things. He's talking about a, a biblical worldview. But here's a verse that I think truly shapes the perspective that, that we should have over in the book of Romans chapter 8. In verses 5 and 6, listen to what, what Paul says. He says, for those who are in accord with the flesh, set their minds Talking about a mindset, your perspective, how you, how you look at things. For those who are in accord with the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are in accord with the Spirit, things of the Spirit. For the mindset on, on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the Spirit is life and what? Peace. which is what the mind and the soul so desperately wants. Peace. That's why Jesus would say to all of his followers, peace I give to you. My peace I leave with you. Regardless of circumstances. Regardless of what is happening around you, I want your mind as my people to be at rest, to be at peace because your identity is in me. A third thing I would add to this and would close with this 
In struggling with these kind of, of issues, along with the importance of defining who you are, deciding who you are, deci defining who you are as a person once and for all, and determining to think as such, that you must also dedicate yourself to the day. In the midst of these storms, in the midst of our worst mental anguish, in the midst of, of laboring to be well, what you have to do above all else is you have to dedicate yourself to the day. Because reality is this is all that any of us have is right now. This day. Not tomorrow. No fretting over the past, but the anxiety is caused by the uncertainty. Many times it's just this preoccupation with the uncertainty of the future. And my own experience has been is that the best way to deal with this uncertain future is making sure I'm squeezing everything I can get out of today. Notice the forward look of this psalmist in Psalm 43 and 3 and 4. Send out your light and your truth. They shall lead me. Even in my darkness, I know out on the perimeter of this darkness, there, there is a light. There is a glimmer of light. Send out your light and, and your truth. They shall lead me. The truth is, is the way that, that we should go. The path that is to be followed. Send out your light. Even in my season of darkness, send out your light and your truth, and they shall lead me. They shall bring me to your holy hill and to your dwelling places. Then I will go to the altar of God, to my exceeding joy, and I will praise you on the lyre, God, my God. He is clinging to hope. He is clinging to what the future might look like. See, he's moved past remembering, and when he was preoccupied, Focused upon his uh, misery, as oftentimes happens in seasons of melancholy, uh, we get sentimental. We think about the past always. Preoccupied with the past. Instead of the past, uh, the past we allow it to become a monument of how things ought to be, of how things used to be. When the, when the intention of memories, as God has given them, is to recognize his faithfulness in the past and let it be motivation for the future. Remembering is a terrible place to camp out. Even the wisdom writer in Ecclesiastes said it is not, it is not wisdom that asks the question, why were former days better than today? That question does not emerge from wisdom. In fact, there's nothing more foolish to think that what was will be again. And so the psalmist is realizing that the turn that is in store for him, it is somewhere in front of him. And then even at the end of that psalm, he says, wait for God. For I will again praise him for the help of his presence, my God. Waiting is the language of hope. Waiting is the language of hope. Hope sticks around. Hope stays in the day. Hope is willing to wait. Hope means that I'm curious enough about God and the providential purposes of God and God's sovereign control. I'm curious enough about that even in my darkest days that I'm going to stick around and see how the story unfolds. You got to stay engaged. You got to stay in the story. And my experience has been is those that struggle with mental well-being and mental health, they are some of the strongest people that I know that I've ever met. Some can't even imagine the battles that they fight each and every day just to stay in the day, just to be where their feet are, just to stay in today and to live fully today 
knowing that every day has a life and death of itself. Every day is a day unto itself. And they live and they persevere with this hope that tomorrow could be different. And I'm not going to blow smoke up your dress and tell you that tomorrow will always be better. It may be worse. But hope is curious, curious enough to see what tomorrow holds by sticking around today. Do not be discouraged. What the psalmist is figuring out, I don't know if you notice the redundancy, as he goes from darkness to light in so many of these verses, despairing to language of faith. I think what the psalmist is doing is he's doing something that we can all put into practice. What he has realized is that it is, easy, it is easier to act your way into a new feeling than it is to feel your way into a new act. That if I say this long enough, if I, if I believe this strongly enough, Circumstances will eventually give way to other circumstances. They always do. And my attitude and my perspective will be elevated. But I've got to believe it and I've got to practice it. Listen, I don't know what you're facing. I would not pretend to. I know what some of you are, but not all of you. But you have a future. You have a future in the providential purposes of God that may be in your state of mind right now that you cannot even imagine. Paul said, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it even entered into the mind of man the things that God has in store. Theological reality is God is omnipresent. That means that you're never apart from him as well. Not only does it mean that God is always present in all places, but it means that you are never apart from him. You have a future. And the main reason is, is because our God is a living God. Let's pray together. Father, so often our minds war against us. Often, Lord, our minds seek to convince us of things about ourselves that simply are not true, that are in fact lies. And Father, we find ourselves always, I pray, at a place when when we have these battles and these struggles that we as your people would maintain a witness that finds our identity in you. And that because our identity is in you, it would shape how we think and how we embrace this day, not allowing tomorrow to steal away our energy and our time and our resources that are necessary to live well this day. Father, how grateful we are that you are a God that has made provision for us, for our lives to be made full in Christ and Him alone. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.